May I have your attention, please? Being 7.05 7 p.m., and with a quorum of 208 voters, I ask that you take, actually, I'm gonna ask you to remain standing while we salute the flag. Flags over this way on the corner. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Everyone, please take their seats so we can get started with this special town meeting on Monday, October 15th, 2018. Everyone in the hall, should please have the salmon colored motion sheets that contain the motions, which give a more detailed explanation of the articles and the Selectman Finance Committee, Planning Board, uh, Board of Health, Personal Advisory Committee, and Capital Planning recommendations. These are on the table in the back of the gym. Also, on the table initially when you first come in on the left, actually on the right, there are spare reading glasses, if anyone's forgotten their reading glasses that you can borrow. And um, there are also headsets. If you have a hard time hearing, you just uh, turn the switch on, put them on your head, and you'll be able to hear things more clearly. Everyone, anyone who needs them is welcome to use them. I am Susan McNeil Spooler. I am the moderator of town meeting, and it gives me great honor to convene this special town meeting of the town of Westford, Massachusetts in the United States of America. As we have been meeting since March 2nd, 1730, that's longer than our country has existed. First, I would like to recognize Glenn Secor and Ellen Doucette, who served on the Finance Committee. Glenn st started serving in 2014, and Ellen started in 2010. I would like to introduce our two new members of the Finance Committee, Patricia Pilachowski and Beth Morrison. Thank you. If you wish to address town meeting at any time this evening, I ask you to approach one of the three microphones that we have set up. Tell us your name, tell us where you live in Westford. We have three microphones and I will describe the purpose of them to you. The middle microphone is for questions and for those looking for information. If we are discussing a motion and you are opposed, I ask you to please go to the opposed microphone on my right and your left. And the one on my left and your right is for those who wish to speak in favor. Each of the microphones has a sign on it. Please address all questions to me, the moderator, and I will find the best person or persons to answer your query. What this allows the moderator to do is to balance the debate so that you can hear from some in favor and some opposed, and we can have a balanced discussion. If you absolutely can't make it to the appropriate microphone, that does not preclude you from speaking. Please go to the closest microphone to you. If you have any questions at any time, go to the center microphone and say, Madam Moderator, I have a question. That's the part of parliamentary law that you need to know, and we will get your question answered. In order not to take the meeting's time to read the motions verbatim, I would ask for a motion to accept the wording for the motions as printed on the salmon colored sheets and filed in the town clerk's office on October 15th, 2018, and to waive the reading by the moderator. You will not have to, you will not only have the, um, have them in front of you, but Mike Wells, the director of technology will project every motion on the screen behind me. Do I have a motion to waive the reading? Is there a second? All in favor say aye. Any, I'm sorry, anyone have any questions, first of all? No questions? Okay, all those in favor? All opposed? Thank you. It passes. Town meeting is where we come together in a civil assembly, as a community, in a tradition that's older than the Commonwealth itself. Here are the rules I look forward to everyone following. All debate will be conducted in a respectful and courteous manner in a calm and collected tone. All questions and comments will be directed to the moderator and limited to the subject being debated. No comments of a personal nature are allowed. In keeping with Westford meeting, town meeting tradition, no applause or other responses for any debater is allowed. 
If you have any amendments, please put them in writing and hand them to the moderator. Motion for town employees and non-residents. Before we get into the financial discussions, we have members on the floor who are not voters from Westford, from Westford Town Council, Assistant Town Manager, various department heads, and for them to be able to address the meeting, our bylaws say that we must vote and there needs to be a two-thirds majority to allow this. So I would ask for a motion to allow all staff who are non-voters of the town, as well as town council and consultants hired by the town of Westford to sit with their respective committees and be able to address this meeting. May I have this motion? Thank you. May I have a second? Any questions? All those in favor? All opposed? Motion passes with two thirds, two -thirds majority. Are there any questions from the voters about protocol, procedure, or order? Hearing none, we move along. Article one. Article one. I have a motion to dismiss. Article one is printed in the motion sheets. So moved. Do I, do I have a second? Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Article two, approve fiscal year 2019 budget adjustments. I have a motion under article two is printed in the motion sheets. So move. Is there a second? Uh, any discussion? Jody, would you like to get up and explain? Oh, Charles. Charles Stark, please, um, please go to the microphone. I'm Charles Stark at 14 Christopher Road, the chair of the Recycling Commission. In the 30 years Westford has been recycling, the town has often had to make changes as the markets have changed, usually to allow us to recycle more. For example, in 1988, the only paper we could recycle were newspapers. Then our vendor also accepted junk mail and magazines, then telephone books. What you and I put in our curbside recycling is a commodity, just like oil and wheat. It only has value if our contractor, Republic, can sell what they collect from your bins and toters to other companies who can make use of it. 20 years ago, our paper went to make the book covers for the Harry Potter books. Our glass became glass fault for paving roads. Never has the town seen the market for recycling changes drastically and not for the better as it has the last two years. The buyers are getting much more demanding about the quality of the product they will buy. Some contaminations are baddies use, that used to be good. Now Republic can be fined if they deliver loads filled with plastic bags, which is a real baddie or plastic toys, spaghetti sauce still in the glass jar, mixed in with recyclables. And that cost is being passed on to the town. Sometimes whole loads are rejected and Republic pays per ton to dispose of them. In addition, the largest buyer of the recycling that is generated in the United States has been China. And in 2017, China adopted a new policy that sets the accepted contamination in paper at 1%, with further restrictions on metals and plastics, too. China is rejecting shipments at the dock. This has all made recycling costs more. Lowell, for one, has gone from paying nothing to have its recycling hauled away to shelling out as much as $75 a ton, which adds up to roughly half a million dollars a year according to Gunther Wellenstein, who's Lowell's recycling director. So why don't we just stop recycling? Because in 1992, Massachusetts established waste bans that prohibits cans and bottles from going to a landfill or an incinerator. In 1994, plastic and paper were added to the waste bans. 
Westford's trash has gone to an incinerator since the dump closed in 1985. So the Recycling Commission sees no alternative this evening than to ask town meeting to vote for this $80,000 additional cost for this year. Going forward, we will be asking you for your help as we work in every way possible to make the quality of recycling so good that there will be no need for fines or additional fees. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone has any questions. Next, Jody, did you? We have three different items here, $80,000 for recycling expenses, town manager expenses of $200,000, and then water enterprise personal services, $8,000, and water enterprise reserve fund. If anyone has a question about this, if they would say hold, I will read these again. Recycling expenses, $80,000. Town manager expenses, $200,000. Uh, water expense enterprise personal service is eight thousand dollars water enterprise reserve fund two hundred thousand dollars did i hear a hold on town manager expenses okay okay we will vote on recycling expenses water enterprise personal services and water enterprise reserve fund I have a motion under Article 2 is printed on the motion sheets. Is there a second? Any discussion besides this? Okay, all those in favor say aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. So now we will discuss um, town manager expenses of $200,000. Good evening. Uh, so, uh, my name is Tom Clay, and we're going to bring you up to speed on what's been happening uh, on, the, um, on the efforts around school safety and violence prevention in Westford. Uh, as many of you know, it was brought up in the last town meeting, it's been brought up in many public forums since. Uh, what are we doing uh, to make sure that we're really uh, ensuring the safety and wellness of all of our students and really all the community members uh, here in Westford? So, um, we, we have been uh, doing a number of things along the way, really driven by the schools and by the police, and I'll identify what some of those have been. So we're not standing still. There's been a lot of activity going on uh, on this very important issue. Uh, but we thought it was a good uh, opportunity to form a task force, and I'll describe who the members of that task force are in just a second, to look at this more carefully and maybe seek some outside advice uh, from people who've been through this journey before and experts in the field to help us put together a really comprehensive plan that we can begin to build into our planning going forward that looks really carefully at both facility security and uh, health and behavioral wellness. Um, so what's happened so far, and this, this is a, a, I'm gonna go through this quickly. This is sort of a, a list of some of the activities that have been going on over the past 12 to 24 months uh, related to this important topic already. These are things that have been done uh, with the schools in coordination with our first responders, uh, the police and fire. So there's been a number of meetings with administrative staff and highlighted potential issues. Uh, there's been additional training uh, for the school resource officers, so there's more flexibility and more redundancy uh, for that coverage. There's been a number of grants filed for for additional safety equipment. Uh, we've held a number of active shooter drills at the Westford Academy uh, and also in the town uh, buildings that uh, have included uh, all the different town resources. We've done a number of simulations with the dispatch center to make sure the dispatch center is well equipped uh, to handle all the things that would happen in an event like that. Uh, and we've held two uh, forums to get community input on public safety as it relates to schools. Uh, we've also done a full ALICE drill, um, which is the, uh, the program that we use for uh, active shooter response uh, in a number of the schools that are listed here. We've done additional training for the school staff, bus drivers and substitutes. Uh, we've done a reunification drill with the school administration, uh, and the uh, school resource officer and the school dean have collaborated in producing a school public safety video on proper barricading and cover techniques for students. So uh, a large amount of activity, uh, a few more. Um, we worked with uh, our state rep uh, on uh, school resource offer, officer legislation uh, and looking at ways that we might be able to lock down the rooms in a more straightforward way. Uh, we've looked at multi-hazard and MERP plans, uh, which are multi-hazard evacuation medical emergency response plans. 
We looked at continued opportunities to improve uh, through the dispatch center, and we've done a number of train the trainer classes with paramedics uh, around uh, some of the narcotics related threats that we'll see that we're seeing here in our community. So who's on this uh, task force that's been assembled? I want to talk to you a little bit about who's on it and then what we're asking for today and what we think some of the next steps might be. So there are uh, two members of the Board of Selectmen, uh, Scott and myself. Uh, Avery Adam, the chair of the um, school committee, is also on this. We have representatives from the Board of Health. Uh, Superintendent Olson uh, is involved in this as well. Uh, we also have the superintendent from Neshoba Tech who's taken part of this. And Neshoba Tech has done a number of very interesting things in this regard that are a little bit different from what we've done here in town, uh, at least so far. The town manager and then uh, very importantly, we have the police chief and the fire chief involved. And really, the, the mandate that we've taken on is to look at the uh, town and school safety practices and then provide recommendations to the Board of Selectmen uh, and the school committee on what we find and to build those recommendations into future planning. Um, so we began to meet in September. Um, early on, it became clear, uh, both from our experts, like our excellent chief, uh, fire chief and police chief, that we had done a lot of good things so far using our own input, but it seemed like a good time for us to bring in some expert input from people who've seen this happen at other schools, been through this journey before. Uh, we thought, uh, after looking at a little bit of the early uh, data and, and early studies, that we really, although they fit very closely together, uh, the consultants who typically do this work typically are either more focused on school security and facility safety or health and behavioral wellness and violence, violence prevention, sort of detection, intervention on that side. And so uh, the recommendation that this committee has come up with is that we actually prepare a request for proposal to get expert assessment uh, on both of those things. Now, we'll keep those integrated together. Uh, we expect that we'll have a lot, of, uh, a lot of blending, but because many of the schools that we've looked at so far have already done this work, uh, have typically found that there's a strong body of expertise on the facility assessment side and on the behavioral health side. We think it's best if we pursue uh, and get some expert input on each. Um, we are preparing the draft uh, request for proposal now with school security. We've identified a couple of the key things that we hope to, uh, to cover, which I'll cover on the next slide. Um, we looked at other towns that are about our size who've gone through this so far. And the range of, uh, there's a pretty wide range of, of what the cost of these assessments are. These are detailed assessments of the facilities with detailed recommendations about what would be best to do, uh, best balance for students and for staff at each of the buildings. Um, there's a pretty big range. We've seen most of the bids come in between, say, 80 and 100 for towns that have gone through this, 80 and $100,000 on the facility side. Some of the areas of focus that we'd like to cover, um, we want to look closely at the recommendation from, from the people who are focusing most closely on that, that's Superintendent Olson, uh, Fire Chief and Police Chief is to look at uh, access control, both interior and exterior, uh, and look at entrance screening, staff protocols for visitors, and facility before and after hour security measures. Uh, evaluate the documentation and training of security and safety procedures, including detailed crisis plans and procedures, uh, specific evacuation and reunification plans. Evaluate prospective new employee screening procedures. So we want to add to what happens when someone comes to be part of our team taking care of students, or being a li librarian, or serving the town. Uh, make sure we're doing an appropriate background screen. Uh, for those folks. Uh, we want to evaluate prospective new employee screening procedures. Uh, just mention that. Uh, we want to look at the school resource officers. So there's been a lot of discussion about what's the right balance for us, for Westford, in terms of school resource officer presence in the schools. We want to look closely at that and see what best practice recommends. What's the right level of police presence for the different levels of schools that we have in Westford? Uh, we want to look at emergency response capabilities and the instant command system. And one of the best practices that I think we can learn a lot from other schools and also from Neshoba Tech is to consider uh, creating a geofence, which would allow us to monitor social media for key terms uh, and so we can get some early detection. It's, it's the case that most people who cause a violent event in a school have told many people about it and posted on social media about it before they do it. And there is technology available today that would let us uh, go through the publicly available uh, social media landscape identify key terms, and then receive those in the form of alerts. So that's something that uh, we don't, we're don't we learning about, but we want to be part of this best practice study that we'd like to uh, engage in. We also um, think uh, equally important, and in some ways more important, is to focus on behavioral wellness, behavioral health, and violence prevention. We're preparing a separate RFP in that area. Uh, again, we've been fortunate because there's a number of other schools like Lexington and Falmouth that have recently kicked off efforts like this. Uh, we have got a, a pretty good budgetary range uh, between eighty and one hundred thousand uh, dollars, and I'll talk to you about some of the things that are typically included in that. Um, often, that would include uh, 
what is the behavioral uh, health and wellness and violence prevention programs that have proven fact-based track records. In the literature, there are some programs that have an excellent track record of reducing violence in the ninth, in the ninth, 10th, 11th grade range. Some of those programs actually start though at much younger grades. So we wanna take a look at those programs and some of those we already are, are likely doing, but we wanna make sure we look at, we make sure we've got the best ones uh, and that we're using those most effectively. Uh, we wanna use enhanced use of training programs and technology for early detection for those who might pose a risk to themselves or others. Uh, again, many people who either cause harm to themselves or others in an environment of school I've told a number of people about it or posted about it on social media. We want to make sure that we've got a good mechanism to that all that information gets back to the people that can help as quickly as possible. Uh, we'd like to identify and implement positive interventions for those that are at risk. So we want to be uh, actively reaching out to people that are, that are uh, showing signs of risk. Uh, we want to have sustained community, community education on what these resources are. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of parents, uh, may not be aware of what all the programs are that are currently in effect. So we want to have a sustained way we're communicating with everybody what some of these uh, uh, tools and practices are that can help. And we want to look carefully at other communities for other ideas that we haven't thought of. Uh, we're, we're aware that there are things that we don't know uh, and want to make sure that we're asking about other good practices and ideas that uh, other communities have generated that we might borrow from. So the, what we're asking you for today is a funding request um, to support both of these requests for proposals to do both of these expert consulting studies. Uh, we'd like to pull them together relatively quickly uh, and uh, be able to have that information, some of the early findings for these studies by the time we come back to you in Springtown meeting. And then uh, the school committee and, the, and the, the town resources will have the inputs they need to do the kind of detailed planning that we'd like to do to get some of these recommendations actually into the budget uh, and into reality and, and, uh, and helping it to keep us safe. Um, it's a combined $200,000, so we're budgeting, we have forecast that it's roughly 100,000 for each, so that's, that's where the 200,000 comes from. Um, and uh, we will certainly adopt what we can as we go. So if we learn things um, that we can redirect resources to, uh, I think the school committee or the town will do that. If it's things that require new resources, then they can fall into our planning uh, as early as next year. Possibly there may be some things that we bring forward in the spring that might uh, help us have an impact on this really important area. Um, and that's it, Scott, did I miss anything? Thanks, thanks, Tom. Uh, the one thing I would mention is um, I think there's been a lot of focus on school safety, and rightly so, but <clears throat> if we have a lot of town buildings that are also open to the public that have had um, incidents with the public in the past, uh, and so we want to make sure that uh, the library, for example, town hall, um, the, the Rodenbush, also have this, this investigation to say what is the best practice to keep our staff safe in these buildings um, just as, as if they were in school. So uh, it is a little broader than we had maybe discussed in spring. I think it's important that we, that we keep all of our town staff safe. Thank you. Any discussion? Marilyn Frank, 6 Champlain Road. At the strategic planning um, event that we had this past time, I mentioned the fact that our schools are open during election. That costs nothing so that we don't have our schools open when we have an election day. Have you discussed that? Um, I support what you're doing, but have you discussed this no-cost item? And if so, when will that be implemented? Certainly not November 6th. Good evening. Bill Olson, Superintendent of Schools, Maryland. We have uh, discussed that. And beginning with the next year's school calendar, the 2019-2020 school year, we'll have either full professional development days or no school on election days so that we can ensure the security of our staff and students. Yes, for, if there are four elections, uh, what we'll do is, um, as I said, we'll plan so that it is minimal, minimal intrusion to the length of the school year to the greatest extent possible uh, and maximum benefit for our staff in terms of professional development. So I want to thank everyone for reminding me. We actually did change uh, one of our PD days this May, this upcoming May in this year's calendar. So thank you for reminding me of that. that. Yes, yes, that's correct. Thank you, Bill. Paul Fossbender, 14 Texas Road. Uh, when I see an, uh, an article like this, I, really two things come to mind. 
one is should we be doing this work and the second is how should we pay for it i think your presentation really uh, did a good job of presenting the why we should do it part of it but uh, the question i have is is this the best way to fund it uh, it says we're taking the money from free cash in my experience free cash is uh, usually not free there's some opportunity cost for uh, for using it for this purpose versus a lot of the other purposes that we could be using the free cash for so what will be we not be doing because we're taking the 200,000 from free cash Dan can you answer that for us please Dan O'Donnell finance director so we recently had our free cash certified at 4.3 million. That was about $500,000 more than last year. So there is some capacity to have uh, this expense uh, this fiscal year. Um, typically what we use free cash for is any uh, surplus uh, supplementals to uh, budgets at the town meeting, uh, any capital items, and we usually fund our snow and ice deficit from it. So with my projections, we do have the capacity to absorb that this year. Thank you, gentlemen. Dennis Galvin, 90 Conquer Road. Madam Moderator, I have a uh, amendment for this item. Should I give it to you? Yes, please. So we have an amendment to the second item in Article 2. And so what we will do is, Mike, put up already? Oh, beautiful. OK. So we will vote. <laughs> OK, all right. So what we will do is we will vote to accept the amendment. I'm sorry. I have a motion to amend. I need a second. Any discussion? Sure. Okay. I will read the whole, and I will read it, the amendment. I will read the article, and I'm sorry, the motion, then I will read the, the red part as well. That the town appropriate from free cash the sum of $200,000 in order to supplement the following fiscal year 2019 operating budgets to the fund and town school safety task force con consultant requests for proposals. Here's the amendment. And further that these funds be allocated for the sole purpose of assessing, evaluating and approving the security of the Westford public schools. Now, uh, gentleman who put it forth. Yeah, uh, Dennis Galvin. Yeah. Okay, uh, Madam Auditor, thank you very much, uh, members of the town meeting. The purpose of this um, of this particular uh, amendment is to try to capture the concern that um, we believe the uh, town uh, parents, particularly the schools, have expressed over the course of the last year or so as a result of some incidents, both nationally and locally. There are three issues that this uh, that uh, the current uh, the current item we feel, or I believe, is deficient. Number one, it doesn't reflect the priority, correct priority. Number two, the resources are not sufficient. And number three, it doesn't, it doesn't capture the urgency for this. Now, let me try to take this and explain it a little bit more. Um, I just explained the priority. There is a issue nationally and, 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 and locally as well over the concern over the schools. Uh, that is a, it is the highest and most vulnerable and most devastating um, asset that we could lose in this town of the children in our schools. The resources that have been expended for this um, are not, is not sufficient. Uh, they're asking for $200,000. They're going to split it between um, mental, uh, mental health and, uh, and physical security resources. 
First of all, my comment is that is an artificial distinction. They have to be comprehensive. They have to be unified and synthesized as one evaluation. Second of all, just to do the, the public schools, say three schools, um, the, the Westford Academy and the two middle schools, would probably cost you about $200,000. Spreading $100,000 across the town for fiscal security evaluations, as well as for mental health evaluations, would dissipate resources and you'd wind up with a mediocre product at best. So we think that this is not su sufficient and we need to be able to uh, adapt on it. Now, the last thing I'd say is nobody here is objecting to the town doing a security assessment. In fact, it's, I applaud the Board of Selectmen for, for taking that on. The point that we're trying to make here is that can be done, and as you've already as you already heard from them, there's an extended period of time before this gets implemented. We just think the public schools should come up to the front and be dealt with first, and that's the purpose of the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, Tom Klein, please. I just want to respond to the three points quickly about the priority, the resources, and the, uh, and the urgency. So uh, I, I would respectfully disagree, um, based on the work that, that the committee has done so far, about where the most good can be done to actually keep people safe and reduce the risk of violence. So I think that we really have to look at the behavioral health aspects alongside the physical security side. So I wouldn't agree that, that, uh, that one should come first or the other should go in a different direction. From a resources point of view, um, the best information we have is what other towns with similar building counts and similar size populations have done. That's where our estimates have come from. So, uh, I, and again, we're just talking about doing the planning and assessment. The actual implementation is a whole other realm that would come before you again in budgeting. So we're not suggesting that we can do the whole job, but in terms of just doing this first assessment, the communities that we've looked at that have done work like this are within this range. And in terms of the urgency, um, what we've done so far is we've actually split our committee into two working groups. One is looking at facilities, uh, and that's where the chief, the fire chief, Phil Olson sits. And then we have another group that's looking at the behavioral health. That's where the Department of Health reps are and some other folks that are really focused on that. So I think we can do both well. I think we can give both a high level of urgency. Uh, I don't think we have to make that choice. Thank you, Tom. Gentleman at the microphone. I have a, a three part. Can you tell us who you are and where Bruce, you live? Bruce Rosenberg, 123 Westview Drive. Thank you. I have a, a three part interconnected set of questions and clarifications. And I think the first one, Tom, you started to address, and that is the $200,000 is to prepare two RFPs. It's not the implementation funds. Related to that, then I would ask you my experience with both putting together many RFPs and responding to them in my work in the, in, in the government sector is as I'm presuming that there is some type of budget that you have in mind so that when this RFP is indeed put together, somebody knows whether they're, whether they're building a soccer field or a football stadium. And the third part of this is that Recognizing that every community has their own very specific needs. Our facilities, our schools are different, therefore how to protect them and so on. Our demographics are different in terms of behavioral needs. But there is some, let's call it related or, or, or leverage that we can get from related communities. So the third part of my question is, what can we do through some economy of related communities? I'm not talking about Westford and uh, someplace in the western part of the state, but a Westford, a Littleton, a Carlisle, or whatever that, that might have some similar related demographics and, and geolocations. Thank you. Tom, please. Just a, just a semantics point, I think, I, think, we, I think we are in agreement. This is just. This initial phase is not to do the work, but it is to have the planning and detailed community survey and all of that done. Um, the other question related to, um, are we giving guidance to the people doing the work about what the end budget might be? We, we have not come to that point yet. And so I think that'll have to be part of the discovery is, uh, for instance, if we come back and say, we wanna have a, a, a difference in the way that we do access control in the church, not the church, access control in the schools, um, I think we'd have to learn a little bit more about that so we don't yet have that budgetary amount. That does give us kind of a range of outcome, but I think we're gonna to have to learn a little bit more before we can bring that kind of information to you. And uh, another question is, is there some sort of general best practice we can pull in 
sort of quickly without spending a lot of money and spend the money on things that are unique to Westford, that, that is very much our intention. So our hope is the consultants we bring in will have a lot of best practice. And I think our chief and schools already have a lot of best practice on board. But we want to look at each of these buildings. What's the right thing for K2? What's the right thing for 3 to 3.5? Three you know, in that setting for that actual structure. I think that's where most of the money on the facility side will come. Thank you. I'll take one more question in the center for right now. I'm Main Street. Um, could Mr. Galvin please clarify whether or not he was speaking as a voter or whether or not he was representing the amendment made um, proposed by the Finance Committee? And if the latter, whether the uh, Finance Committee unanimously supports the amendment or what their position is. Thank you. Jerry, thank you. Jerry Kerr, Finance Committee. Um, if you look at our vote on this, we were like four, four, three against and two abstained. So it was a very unsatisfying vote. And I attribute that to the fact that we really weren't involved in this process up until now. So we were trying to find out information either from the selectmen's meeting last week or right before this meeting. So what it exhibits is confusion on our part. Now talking to the selectmen, one of the things we've asked for is going forward that a member of the finance committee be on this group so we can understand all of the ins and outs of it and contribute to it. Now, as far as the amendment, that's uh, his amendment is a private citizen, not a, not as a member of the finance committee. Um, so the finance committee is what I said. We voted 4-3-2, and we would try to resolve that in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Opposed? Uh, actually, this is just the closest microphone. Um, I'd like to speak to the amendment, and I'm in favor of the amendment. Elisa Nakashian, Holsberg, Betty Lane. Uh, back last March, February or March, we had an unfortunate incident. I don't need to go into that. A lot of parents spoke up and said, what about safety? What about our kids, kindergartners, first graders? We need to make sure that they're safe. So months have gone by. We're going to be coming up on a year. And I appreciate the work that this committee has done. And I appreciate you're trying to widen it into town buildings as well. But you know what? I'm not worried about the police. They've got guns. I'm not worried about town hall. You got 911 right next door. I'm worried about our kids at schools. There's no guarantees in the world. And even if you handle mental health in this community, that doesn't preclude somebody from another neighboring town coming in and, and um, moving along some unfortunate path. What I want to see is an expedited path towards addressing safety in our schools. And then if we need to do more, come on back. Let us know what we need to do. But as a parent, I'd like to see that we answer the call of the parents who spoke up last summer, last fall. I don't remember when it was. It was last year. We're, we're almost a year into this. And I'd support this amendment. I think we need to focus on the schools first and then, and then figure out where we go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Al Prescott, Lakeshore Drive North. This is my first time ever addressing town meeting. I'm quite nervous. Welcome. How are you? Thank don't you. Don't worry. <laughs> You're doing Madam, fine. Madam Moderator, we are having this discussion tonight for one reason and one reason only. It's not because of a spat of mass shootings at libraries, fire departments, or police departments. The reality is we are having this discussion solely because of the horrific acts that have occurred in schools. And the reality is that when you look at the FBI report for mass shootings, the percentage of shootings in public buildings is 71% occur in schools. That's where the focus needs to be. I applaud this amendment. But that is what laser focus. Go where the problem is and solve it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Center microphone, please. Mr. Cologli, uh, one patent lane. I am confused by what we're going for. <clears throat> I think uh, I was under the impression that this money was going to go for the studies themselves. It looks like uh, from the uh, wording, and I'm, I do a lot of proposals and requests for proposals. Uh, <clears throat> if this is only f to fund people to prepare proposals, then, <clears throat> then this needs to be amended. Because what we're looking for is to have the actual money being spent on the studies themselves. A request for proposal is not is what it says. Can there be a clarification as what you're really looking for? So exactly, it is a it is funding the study itself. Then I believe the wording is incorrect. Okay. 
over here. I, I'm just speaking to the amendment, and, and I agree that your uh, name and Jim, where you Jim, live, Jim Gazzo, Carolina Lane. Thank you. Um, the the uh, end of the original text there, where it says to to uh, fund the town and school safety task force consultant requests for proposals. This shouldn't be to fund the request for proposals. The request for proposals is going to be produced by the committee. This should be used to respond to those proposals by assessing, evaluating, and improving the security of the schools. And I'm, I'm emphasizing it should be of the schools. That's where the emphasis needs to be. That's where the urgency is. And that should happen first. Center microphone. Oh, sorry. Would you like to address that, Scott? Center microphone, please. My name is Hayu Kester. I live on Providence Road. Uh, I'm a library trustee. And I'm speaking here both as an individual as well as a member of the Board of Library Trustees. But I'm not speaking on behalf of the entire board because we've not discussed this amendment. The way I read this, my question is, does it specifically leave out the library? If so, I'd like to speak to that. OK. Dennis, please. So I missed the question. We were trying to figure out the legality of proposals or RFPs, but uh, what was the question once again? Does this leave out the library? The amendment. The amendment is clear. It speaks to the Westwood schools for the first time. It doesn't exclude it, but the priority goes to the schools for this, this go around. It re relates to the two hundred thousand dollars that's been appropriated here. That's what that's, that pertains to, and that's what the wording pertains to, as well. Okay, Dennis, I, may I speak to this? Certainly. Thank you, Dennis. That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> as a trustee, I'm very concerned about the safety of our staff and patrons, and uh, it's been a concern. And we mentioned that at selectmen's meetings as well. Uh, yes, all the emphasis has been and the media etc it's been on schools but i'd like to remind folks that within i believe the last six months or so there have been a couple of major issues in libraries in the commonwealth in the town of arlington a person was murdered in the library i can't remember exactly what the other incident was all about was boston boston a librarian killed boston Winchester, so, so it's not just the big nasty cities that have this problem. So I would strongly encourage you to strike, vote against the amendment. And uh, if the amendment passes, I'd like to make a second amendment afterwards. Okay. For Blumenthal, 14 Plain Road. I support this amendment uh, because it speaks to the uh, priorities. The higher threat, the higher risk is at the schools. Therefore, schools must be addressed first. So let us do that. And a small uh, a comment. I would like to learn, probably everybody else uh, so, uh, how are you going to select the experts to provide those RFP? How and and where? Thank you, Scott. Can you address that, or Tom? Uh, I was going to say that the uh, selectmen took a vote on the amendment, and the uh, selectmen opposed the amendment five to zero. And the rationale is, uh, as Al mentioned, it, okay, fifty-one percent of these incidents are in schools; twenty-nine percent aren't. Um, our our most popular library programs are our young children reading programs. The Rodenbush Community Center, when it reopens, will be primarily for youth programs. So the idea that somehow only our children are vulnerable in schools is just not true. We have town buildings. That we're not looking at the fire department or the police department. They've got axes and guns. But we are looking at senior center, library, um, town hall, and Rodenbush as places that are soft targets where we get um, opportunities um, for bad things to happen, and we need to make sure we address the plan for that. Okay. Uh, with, with regard to the question about selection of, uh, of experts, so um, 
we're fortunate that there are a number of communities that we can look to and look at people who've submitted bids to those communities for similar types of work. So we have a population of you know, eight to 10 providers in each case that have, have experience and a track record to do this work. And what will happen, I believe, is that the sub, we haven't agreed on this as a committee, but I would expect that the subcommittees will, will take, will do interviews, will, uh, will review resumes, probably narrow down to a smaller field, then the whole committee will look at them. And then I think we'll probably ask the school committee uh, and the board of selectmen to weigh in as well. So it, it would be like selecting a, a service provider for you know many, many other kinds of services, find people with experience and skills, do a careful screen and review. Center, microphone please. Jim Allen, 104 Plain Road. Um, it was briefly touched on just recently that Rowdenbush is in the list, but what about Frost and Rowdy at Old Man? Scott? Yes, they're, they're, they're all, all three are basically part of the Rodenbush uh, consortium, so I guess all three are included. And they are not part of Westford Public Schools? They are not. So they would be excluded by this amendment? Correct. Thank you. Thank you. In favor again? You have a question? Uh, to augment uh, my statement, everything except uh, for the police department is a soft target just face it. Uh, and uh, it is unclear whether the proposed resources would be enough to investigate everything. Therefore, once again, prioritize. We want to protect everything. I doubt that you can. So do what you can first. Thank you. Show me. The school committee took a quick vote and we would be against the amendment. Um, we are also concerned that that would exclude the mental health, behavioral health piece of the uh, article. Senator Microphone. Hi, Jennifer Valandri, Almeria Circle. I'm a parent of a child in the Westford Public Schools and I'm also a licensed independent clinical social worker trained in violence prevention and mental health. And um, I think we definitely need to put a lot of money into supporting the schools in relation to violence prevention. Also, as far as libraries go, being a soft target and um, the incident that happened in Winchester and other issues in public libraries where people who are sometimes homeless or sometimes members of marginalized populations tend to go during the day, I think it's important to put some kind of a protocol in the libraries in place, as well as the schools, which I hope is important. So I'm wondering if the town would consider a friendly amendment to include libraries in this item. If you have an amendment, you hand it to, you put it in writing and you hand it to me, and then we can have two amendments on the floor at once. Send your microphone. Hi, Juliet Mount, Boston Road. Um, question to the group um, in relation to this proposal and all the details that you've provided. The questions in come to research, me and then I, I'm I, sorry. I pass it to the person, the appropriate people. Um, for the panel. Um, Madam Moderator, can you please ask them, um, based on the research that they did and the concerns voiced here related to priorities, is the amount of 200000 sufficient to provide this town a reasonable assessment by spring for those RFPs without adding risk to our school populations and to properly uh, cover assessments for the library and other public domains? Tom Clay, please. We have so far, Julia, is, uh, is communities have done similar scopes of work and they've quoted amounts that are between, say, eighty dollars and $100,000 for each. So in each case, we've got four or five examples of communities doing this work. So I would answer the question saying, based on everything we can see so far from the, the work that we've done, uh, other communities at least have successfully been able to kick off programs very close to what we're doing, similar size communities, similar level of complexity. And I'm confident that we can get, a, you know, get the work done and certainly get a great start. There's some possibility we could come back after doing more work and say, 
we had to phase this in a certain way. We were able to get 80% of what we wanted. I, I can't say that yet because we haven't done the work. But I think in terms of what we can know from where we are, uh, those are good numbers. Okay. Anything? Caroline Fisher, Depot Street. I'd like to call the question. Okay. I, would, I will allow one more. No? I was here before she was. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't see. I, I've been trying to pay attention to everything here. So I, I saw her before I saw you. Steve Brierley, 16 Phillips Drive. Folks, we're getting way ahead of I'm ourselves. sorry, we, we've called the question, so. Okay. Okay, a second. I'm sorry. All those in favor of moving the question? All opposed? Now we will vote on the amendment. All those in favor of accepting the amendment, which is the red portion up here, which is in further that these funds will be allocated for the sole purpose of assessing, evaluating, and improving the security of West Republic school schools. All those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. Okay, motion fails. Now we will vote on Okay, we'll be putting up another amendment here. Just, just to explain, we're uh, trying to, uh, with town council, address the question of, is it a request for proposal or proposal? So this is more of a housekeeping amendment, but we want to make sure that what we have, what we have up there, what we approve at town meeting is, in fact, the correct authorization, so that should be ready in a second. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Corbo from Town Council's office. Um, I've recommended um, the addition of language based on questions from the floor as to what's being funded, a request for proposals, or the actual hiring of consultants. In my opinion, this language would make it more clear that it's the hiring of consultants in accordance with the request for proposals that's being funded here, not just the request for proposals itself.
I have a motion on the floor. So I have a second. Okay. All of those in favor of the, of the I amendment? Have, I have a question. Oh. Discussion on the amendment. Thank you. Madam Order, I have a question. Um, the Roudenbush Center is a private corporation. It's not actually a town thing. Does that mean that the town is now going to be providing security assessments that, for private corporations and whatnot? I'm just curious. Thank that's, you. That's not germane to this, but Scott will. The Roudenbush is a town building, so it's, it is germane. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll be voting on just the amendment. Is, if, that is, if there's no more discussion, we'll be voting on just the amendment. All those in favor say aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Now we vote on the motion as amended. All those in favor say aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Okay. On to Article 3. Approve fiscal year 2019 budget transfers. I have a motion under Article 3 as printed in the motion sheets. Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Article 4, approve fiscal year 2019 capital appropriations. A motion under Article 4 is printed on the motion sheets. Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion? These are uh, recommended by the Board of Selectmen, the Finance Committee, and Capital Planning Committee. All those in favor say aye. All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Article 5. I have a motion under Article 5. It's printed in motion sheets. Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. All opposed? Motion passes with a majority. Article 6. Acquisition to uh, acquisition of 63 Main Street. I have a motion under Article 6. Do I have a second? Is there any discussion? I see someone coming to the microphone. This was recommended by the Board of Selectmen and the Finance. Oh. There is a presentation. Oh. Well, then I ought to wait. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the background of, on 63 Main Street is, uh, you may recall, we had a building burned in, uh, I think, March of 2016. Um, the fire affected the attic and the roof. The bottom two, two floors of the structure remained intact. intact. Um, in the spring of uh, 2018, the Board of Selectmen directed the town manager to investigate um, what, what was happening with the property with a view towards potentially uh, purchasing it. Um, it took until September 11th for a notice to come back from the owner they plan to sell to the highest bidder. Um, that, of course, compressed our, our timeline quite dramatically. <clears throat> so we um, did put in a bid for $600,000, which was accepted. We have had our architect who's been working on the Rodenbush, uh, another uh, building about the, about the same age, 1893 in the case of the house, um, to take a look at the house and say, is it salvageable? And in fact, he thought it was in remarkably good shape given um, its age and what's, ha what's been happening to it. Uh, the purchase and sales been ex uh, agreed to by the selectman and by the seller. <clears throat> so if town meeting were to approve the uh, property, um, the environment system would begin almost immediately after this to make sure there's no waste oil on the site to look for lead paint or the kinds of things you would normally do 
when acquiring a property. Um, assuming those results are um, clean, we would have a closing on November 16th. At that point, if we have to do anything with HAZMAT, we would do it. Um, right now, our only knowledge is there's a beech tree. If you look at the property on the left-hand side, a very large beech tree that is uh, half dead. <clears throat> and we would need to talk to an arborist, but there's a pretty, very strong chance that the um, half the tree facing Rodenbush could give out in a good storm and, and damage Rodenbush. So that has to get addressed no matter whether you buy that land or not. There is a, a tree issue. Um, and if we were to purchase the land, we would, there is no dis, uh, definitive purpose in mind. Um, we would form a committee to take a look at what is the best use for that property, a committee that uh, would involve residents, and particularly residents of the town center. But this is a building of high visibility to our town, and it deserves a thoughtful process in terms of what the purpose for that property should be. And that will be a fairly broad community um, discussion. Um, I think it probably take about a good year to take a look at that research. I expect to have Suckman Finance Committee, uh, Permanent build, Town Building Committee, a, a broad range of town committees on that uh, project, historical commission, but also I really want to have uh, a large town uh, resident contingent on that, on that property. So why are we doing this? Well, um, in a nutshell, we're trying to buy options. <clears throat> um, this is a distinctive building that's been in the Parvara Town Center for 120, 130 years. Um, we want to be able to control what happens to that property and not somebody else, probably a developer. Um, the uh, architect report in some of its uh, details, and I, actually I was fortunate, I, I walked through it with uh, the realtor, with the town manager, assistant town manager, um, and it is surprising just how much of the building remains intact. The tiles around the wall, around the fireplaces are still there. Um, all the wainscoting is still there. They tore out the sheetrock so it wouldn't have mold from for water, but all the wood products are still there. You can see the bones of the building, um, as, as, as Bill uh, has, has mentioned. So um, it appears to be in very good condition to salvage. Um, <clears throat> this purchase, if we were to approve it tonight, allows the town to make a decision as to what is the best use uh, for that property. It's almost three acres. It abuts the Rodenbush, which is this town property. Behind it is town conservation land. And actually, the property is a little bit of an L shape, as I'll show you in a minute. It's actually got, it actually abuts the town hall property in the back. Um, <clears throat> if we have our year or more of study and that committee decides that it doesn't really have a town use, we still have the option to sell it back as a single family home. We can put on that stroke, stroke of preservation restriction such that it will may, remain um, as it was uh, in perpetuity. This is a picture of the building as it, uh, as it is on the, on the left hand side. Um, <clears throat> You can see this is the rear view. You probably haven't seen that uh, as much. It's in, in the back, it's, it's three stories. In the front, it's two. You see the aerial view, which shows you um, in the back is a barn. Um, it was once a stable, I believe. Um, it's in remarkably good shape. That was not touched by the fire. Uh, there's been some work done to improve it on the second floor. The floors are, are all brand new. Um, it's not insulated or, or wired, but it's a, uh, a very attractive building <clears throat> and, in, and in great shape. Um, this looks at the parcel. So the red um, you see is the how far back the parcel expen extends in the rear, um, <clears throat> well beyond what you might think of in terms of the barn. And you also see where it extends over to the uh, town uh, parking lot behind Town Hall. So conceivably, even if we were to find no use for the building as, as a town, and we wanted to repurpose as a residential building, we could still opt to um, take the parcel and, and cut off a piece behind Town Hall, expand parking uh, a little bit further, buy ourselves another 20 or 30 spots for Town Hall parking, and then still um, release the building. <clears throat> and this takes a view of the, of, the, of the building. You can see, I think, even better how it relates to the Town Hall. You can see how back, in the back it goes to the full length of, of Rodenbush, um, right up against the, the conservation land in the rear. And finally, um, of, our, of our picture is, I think this is probably the best um, shot in terms of looking at a portion of the land relative to the other land that the town owns. Um, Rodenbush on, the, on, my, on my right, um, <clears throat> and the conservation land in pink behind it with, with town hall in, in front of that. So if we don't purchase the land, what could happen to it? Well, it could stay a single family dwelling. That's, that's possible. 
Um, it is, we asked our planning uh, department what could happen if a developer were to purchase it and it could be used in a convention sub conventional subdivision with a probable division into two building lots. Um, it could be converted into a um, multifamily building of uh, four dwelling units if it had a permit from the uh, Board of Appeals. You're seeing that, in fact, on, on Boston Road now, where we've had a older farmhouse reconverted into a multifamily building or in the process of being reconverted to a multifamily building. Um, <clears throat> now, first, Master General Law 41, Section 81L, um, it could be divided into, um, the lot could be divided, leaving the house and barn on separate lots, which lets you, uh, again, create four dwelling units. Other possible uses, it could be a child care facility. This is allowed under our current zoning. A nonprofit membership club, um, religious or educational purposes. It could be used for, for town use. Um, as I mentioned, we could use the back part of the lot or a portion of the back part of the lot for parking. And finally, it actually would, could be allowed to be used for uh, sand and gravel. I would hope that was not the highest possible use for that property, but by our, our uh, zoning laws, that actually is a possibility. So if we were to purchase it, what's, what's the cost? Well, $600,000 is the cost. That is what we have in, um, in our purchase and sale to purchase the building. Uh, talking to Don Mills, who was the architect that took a look at the building, uh, he thinks $85,000 to secure it. That would be essentially building, uh, reinforcing the second floor to support um, a temporary roof that would last us through, in fact, two winters to buy us some time to really do a good, careful process of what to do with the building. And if we were then to sell it, someone who ever gets it will have it buttoned up and we'll have no further deterioration in the structure. <clears throat> and then, of course, there's the minimal testing I mentioned. It's about 2200 if you've all bought property before, you know there's closing costs of 1150 in this case. And then a contingency of 11650 whenever you do anything involving construction, you always have a contingency fund. So that $85,000 um, sort of implies a, a contingency of 11650 uh, just in case the unforeseen happens, which with the historic building, you always want to make sure you have that option. Although the good news is, because it is so exposed inside, we got a pretty good visibility in what it does look like. Um, now, how does this money um, affect you as a taxpayer? So we, that we being the Board of Selectmen, have decided to use uh, capital subsidization as a means to fund this uh, acquisition. The current balance in capital subsidization is $866,000 and $247 to be precise. So if we were to spend the full $700,000, um, we'd have 166247 left. <clears throat> this is where I put on my Dan O'Donnell hat and try to behave like I'm a financial person. Um, this is the expected inflow of money to the capital subdivision fund in the coming uh, two to three fiscal years, which indicates we can rebuild this expense. In fact, take it back to where we were a little bit higher by uh, 2021. So this has no impact on your existing tax. Um, structure, it's all being paid for by civilization, which in fact, that's what we have capital civilization for, is unforeseen capital needs of the town. So with that, um, hopefully with my seven minutes, and we can take questions. Buzz Gologli, uh, One Patent Lane. Uh, first of all, I'd like to point out that I believe in uh, privatization and, and uh, uh, non-government ownership of uh, property. So. My questions are going to be uh, oriented uh, in a negative fashion. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I wonder, first of all, uh, is the owner present? I don't believe so. OK. Uh, I, <clears throat> questions I have is, when this house burned down, was there insurance on the property? That's a good question. Uh, um, it was insured, yes. It was not insured? It, it, it was. It was insured. So. <clears throat> Does the six hundred thousand dollar purchase price account for that? Uh, how how is this owner is this owner getting more than six hundred thousand dollars for the property? I can't speak to how she spent her, her insurance money. Okay, uh, or, fine. Or, or, or in fact, how much she got for insurance? Okay, fine. <clears throat> but that insurance money is not would not go to the town of Westford. It would go obviously to her. Correct. Okay. 
Secondly, right, 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 uh, right now she owns the property, so it doesn't go to us. Right. And but right now, the questions come to me, please. I'm sorry, okay. Ms. Mallory. <clears throat> Does the uh, uh, has the committee considered the loss of tax revenue from the property? Scott, please. Um, I, I don't. It's not, not these numbers, no. I'm not sure what the taxes are. All right. Jody do, you, Jody, do you have that? Thank you. Also, fifty oh, nine hundred. Okay, would you like to fill fifty nine hundred a year? Uh, it's lower than mine. <clears throat> uh, Miss moderator, I'm sorry, my voice is going, but I know uh, I understand. <laughs> uh, also, I'd like to uh, to point out that. Uh, this property would probably uh, be a prime property for private buyers. And uh, are we preempting uh, that opportunity? No, in fact, the, the, um, the owner's decision was to go to a private bid process, which began, um, we, were, we were alerted to it November 11th, um, September 11th, rather. Um, they were due within like 10 days. Um, and so her decision was not to go to the open market. Her decision was to use a private bid situation. And we were one of, I know, three bidders. I do not know who the two were. That's why it's private bid. I see. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this microphone up here. Yes. Thank you. My name is uh, Dana Barasano. I live at 62 Main Street. It's actually the uh, 18th century colonial, white colonial, directly across the street from 63 Main. Uh, first off, I want to commend the town. I think we'll, we have the same desires, which is to maintain the property and its historic value. Uh, the Finance Committee, the Zoning Board, of Appeals Planning Board, the Historical Commission, and the residents, I think have all been working through the years to protect and maintain the look and use and feel that is Westford Center. Uh, with that said, I oppose the town owning or being involved in putting a municipal building at 63 Main Street. I believe this motion goes against the philosophy of what the town wants regarding the integrity of that center. Um, I believe your motion just leaves it too broad in terms of what can happen uh, to that piece of property. Um, Westford Center, to me, provides a unique and wonderful experience for many reasons. The overarching reason is that the feeling of Westford Center radiates the types, of types and the types of activities that it's used for. That feeling is a result of the resident's philosophy on maintaining the center as a place to reside and to congregate as a community, such as at, with the Apple Blossom Parade, whether it's the prom pictures, whether it's band concerts. We've all attended something there, and it feels like a neighborhood and a resident. Westford Center is one of five sections of the town that are on the National Historic Register. This was the result of the hard work of the Historical Mission, Commission, so we thank them for that over the years. This designation was approved by the Massachusetts Historic Commission because Westford Center has maintained its historic look and feel. This has not happened because it is regulated by an historic district or because it is mandated by the town through bylaws or zoning. It is because the owners within the center of town have done it on their own free will and desires. For me personally, it took my wife and I 10 years to restore that home. Along Main Street, there are many other private owners that have done the same. Arnie and Claudette at 58 Main Street continue to paint, continually painstakingly update their house. Kate and Mike, my current neighbors, they're, they're fairly new to town at 60 Main, have main, maintained the tradition of their house as the previous owners of Scott's did. The Descends is running, running Fox Farm at 3 Depot, continuing to, to run and maintain the working stalls and barn. At 59 Main, um, uh, Dr. Raboyne, right next door, who's fairly new in the last few years, continues to update that property as well um, to restore hers. I give you all this background, and I say this, in every case, each owner took it upon themselves to maintain the historic nature of Westford Center. We love the feel of the center, and we believe it helps define Westford as a town. There were no regulations, no pressure from the Historic Commission. We did it because we love it. We believe it adds to the soul of Westford, and that can be done with 63 Main Street. An individual can buy this property and live in it as a private home as it's been lived in by the family since it was built as a wedding gift for Donald and Meta Cameron in 1893. Therefore, I oppose the town of Westford buying this property for any reason. 
I oppose putting municipal municipal building on 63 Main. I believe a municipal building will remove a little bit of the soul of our town and erode the historic feel of the center and diminish what I believe the town residents want of the center. Those of us who will vote no on this on this motion desire to have 63 Main Street maintain its historic significance by maintaining the look, the feel, and use of this property as it has been since 1893. Madam moderator, after this vote, if the motion is defeated and the voters here tonight deny the town the right to purchase this property, in order to affect what can be done when the property is placed on the open market, it is my intention to pre present a resolution to tonight's meeting and respectfully request the selectmen be proactive in attending the planning board and zoning board of appeals hearing regarding any proposed changes at 63 Main. This resolution will act, ask the selectmen to represent the voters at this October at this October 15th town meeting who desire that the Adams House property at 63 Main and its carriage house be maintained to stand on that land as they stood prior to the fire in March 2016, maintaining the integrity and its history and look and feel. Thank you. Thank you. Scott. So just, just two, I, mean, I appreciate the remarks. I think as you began, we agree whether we disagree. Um, there is no motion to make this property into a municipal building. That is not decided. That need not be the case. So it, it could be, but it need not be. In fact, I'd be surprised if that committee were to change the look and feel of the building. But um, so but the bottom line is we, we, we will not make it, a, we, don't, we don't make a commitment tonight for the municipal building. Municipal building sorry. Um, and secondly, the Suckman can certainly be proactive in discussion with other boards and that resolution, but you know, the planning board is a elected board, independent of the board of selectmen. Tonight in this motion, that it will be kept as an RA single family resident only, all right? I think the town would be behind that. I think the ambiguity is the problem that we have, and I think the fact that we have no idea what that would cost and we have no idea what the usage, I think just affords the town to think it could be anything. There has been stated by the town, I'm not, I forget the exact title of the, of the gentleman that stated it, but the size of the municipal building could, on that lot could be anywhere from 14,000 to 16,000 square feet. That to me is a municipal building. That changes the look and feel. So I, I feel the motion in, in and of itself is slightly disingenuous because of the ambiguity. Thank you. You have something to say, Scott? I, I just had one thing. So um, this is a, if we, if we were to purchase this property, we do form this committee to make, to make recommendations back to the Board of Selectmen. Um, if that motion were to be anything that involves spending money, we're back here in front of you again, because we have to have the town approve any capital spending. So um, this decision tonight does not bind us to a, a, any particular outcome, but I can guarantee you it does bind us to, if we want to do anything to it, we're back here in front of you in a year or two years to, to uh, get your blessing. So. If we, were, if we propose a use that is not consistent with the town desire, it'll get shot down. Madam Chair, Madam, Madam Moderator, the, the challenge okay. that I have with that statement is that you're $700,000 in the hole and you won't be able to go to open market with that price because it was a private bid. It never went on the open market. And the reason is I was one of okay. the three people okay, that expressed okay. interest. Thank you. Gentleman in the center. So Bob Booster, Alcorn Crossing. I, I may have missed something, but in, in my experience, whenever the town buys property, we need to have a current appraisal and are constrained by that. So I guess my question is, do we have an appraisal for the building in its current condition? Scott, uh, can you answer that? No, we do not. I haven't actually had time to get one, but also we don't need one. If you have to have an appraisal, if you are buying with CPC funds, because then you must pay no more than the appraised value. But if you're not using CPA money, which we don't tend to do here, so you don't need the appraisal. Gentleman over here. Yes, Dave Earl, uh, 8 Beale Colony Drive. I'm in support of doing this. I think Scott has outlaid a plan that will take uh, some time to evaluate what the ultimate outcome is, but it would solve a major problem we have at Town Hall in that we do not have enough parking. And this lot is very big, appears to be very big, and I think creatively the town could do something very important, keep the center beautiful, if you will, perhaps provide some parking for town hall, which we need badly, 
and I think it would enhance the neighborhood and the town itself. And just one other comment. I think we have to move these things along and we can't get into a dialogue with the people at the mics going back and forth because it drags out the meeting way too long and that's never the way town meeting was meant to be structured. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, hold your applause, please. Hold your applause. Is there someone in the opposition? No. Okay. Senator, Senator. Mike Green, Michael. Hidden Valley Road. I'll try to speak quickly then. Um, so the question on general, I think to Dana's point, the, the motion says general municipal uses. Is there suggested wording that would then leave the options open to which you speak of, Scott? You, you, quite, you direct the I'm questions sorry, to me. I'm sorry, Madam Moderator. Yes, thank you. I'm not sure what the question is. That we have. Well, it says general municipal uses. Right. I think the concern raised by residents is that it says what it says. Um, so if we slice it and flip it and maintain it as a single family residence, which I think sounds like the sense of the meeting, does this wording bind us to anything in the future? I'm going to defer to a lawyer on that one. Thank you. Thank you through you, Madam Moderator. So the, the term general municipal purposes means that it's, it's held by the town, but not for any specific reason. Um, so as, as Mr. Hazelton mentioned, you know, the, the town's going to develop a plan for reuse of this property. And to the extent that implementation of that plan is going to require the expenditure of money, which it probably will, it would have to come back to town meeting for approval to implement that plan. But what this vote does is it gives the town the flexibility to develop that plan without having a specific purpose like for school purposes or conservation purposes, Thank something you. like that. Madam Moderator, another quick Thank question you. if yeah. I can. So if, for instance, some of it is sliced off for parking and the principal resident is sold, does it then have to be deemed surplus uh, property or something in the future? Yes? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Annette Cerullo, um, North Hill Road. Um, my question is, I, I, I'm leaning towards voting for it, but um, my question is what, how the Finance Committee voted. It said we would get that vote tonight. Oh, the phony, a Finance Committee voted 8 to 1 recommending. And the Board of Selectmen it was unanimous. Uh, Senator Microphone. Dempsey Way. I just want to know there are no restrictions on this property, such as it's registered as, historic, as a historical property. I, I want to know if there's restrictions that would prevent any other person from buying it and doing whatever they want with that piece of property. Like the house does not have to remain there. Is that correct? Scott, do you know the answer to that? Well, they can't do whatever they want, no. But um, as I had indicated on um, a prior slide, <clears throat> sorry. Um, there are a lot of uses that would be other than private residence, but no, they can't go um, constructing a, a office building, for example. Okay. Can I just provide one answer that you didn't provide? Bob Schaffer, Seven Lakes Hill Road, former uh, historic commission. Do you want to step in front of the microphone? Um, the demolition delay bylaw would apply to that property, so there would be a six month prohibition against demolition. So there, that's one thing that would protect the property temporarily. Just six months. Just six months. Thank you. Um, Shankar Agreto, Mohegan Place. I request to move the question. Did you, did you have any answers? I, I was just going to answer the question through, through you, Madam Moderator. Okay. Yes. Um, so the question was whether or not there are any restrictions on reuse or um, modification of this building. Um, the Board of Selectmen has obtained an opinion from an architect um, that there are no such restrictions. Um, the residence is in the same category as the Rodenbush listed in the West Westford Center National Historic District. But since there is no local historic district, no special approvals um, would be required other than, as, as was just mentioned, the demolition delay bylaw would apply. Thank you. There was, was there a move, move the question? Was there a second? All in favor of moving the question? All opposed? Okay. Okay. 
No more questions. Okay. So we will take a vote. We need a two thirds majority. All those in favor of requiring 63 Main Street say aye. All opposed? Passes with a two thirds. Article 7. Reduce the amount raised by taxes in fiscal 2019. I have a motion under Article 7 is printed. Madam the Moderator, is yes. it too late to ask for a count, at least a standing count on the last on the last article? No, it's please. not. Okay, we'll we'll do a standing count. I'd appreciate that. Thank, sure, you. thank you. Seven. I'm sorry. Seven people have to also agree with you. Do I have seven people that will? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven people need to ask for. Um, a hand count. Okay. All those in favor of the article, please stand up and you'll be counted. What? Tellers. Tellers, please come forward. Thank you for remaining standing. Okay, everyone who's standing up, please stand, sit down. All those opposed? to acquiring 63 Main Street, please stand up.
Okay, please sit down. Those who you who are standing up. Twenty-three eyes and sixty-eight nays. My, my apologies. Two hundred and thirteen eyes and sixty-eight nays. Motion passes for two thirds. Okay. okay. Article six. I have a motion under Article seven is printed in the motion sheets. Is there a second? Okay. okay. Any discussion? It's to reduce amount ta raised by taxes in fiscal year 2019. All those in favor say aye. All opposed? Passed unanimously. I have a motion under Article 8. It's printed in the motion sheet. Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. All opposed? Passes unanimously. Article 9. A motion under Article 9 is printed in the motion sheets. Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. All opposed? Did I hear no? Motion passes. I have an article under, I have a, I'm sorry, I have a motion under Article 10 is printed in the motion sheets. Is there a second? Any discussion? Any discussion? We have a presentation. No, 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 no presentation. I don't want to take your time, but I did want to point out. We have this program now. If you're over 60 years old, you can um, work for the town and, and earn uh, money towards towards your relief of property taxes. The, the new point I wanted to make tonight is we've actually added a wrinkle, which is if you are disabled and you cannot work for the town, but you have a uh, fellow who is uh, willing to work in your stead, that person under this change would be allowed to work and get tax relief for a disabled individual. I think that's worth pointing out. I think it's just in the great spirit of, of the community. I didn't want that to go without any comment, so thank you. Okay. The, um, the Board of Selectmen voted unanimously to support this. The Finance Committee tabled this. They needed more information. They want to ask some more questions. Dennis Galvin, 90 Concord Road, not speaking for the Finance Committee, but uh, would like to ask, we asked for uh, some information with regards to the criteria that you use to award these tax breaks, and also could you disclose who it is that administers this program so they know who grants the tax breaks? Is Jennifer? Is Jennifer here? Or Annette? There we go. Jennifer, please. Jennifer Claro, director of the Senior Center. Thank you, Madam Moderator, Selectman, and Town Manager. Um, the Council on Aging administers this program. Um, and basically, there's the application process, allows any property owner 
resident that's 60 or over to make application for this program. Okay. Thank you. That's enough. Okay. Any other discussion? Madam Moderator, Dennis Galvin, 90 Concord Road. This is a very simple amendment. It doesn't have to do anything with writing. I just would like to move that the uh, that this uh, article be uh, be referred to the tax slider committee so that some standards and some rules about how this is going to be applied can be developed. Thank you very much. Scott. Well, just speaking as a member of the Board of Selectmen who actually gave the Sutter Committee its charter. This is not part of the charter of the Sutter Committee, so I don't think that would be the best use of their time. Jennifer? Oh, I'm Jennifer's sorry. over there. I'm sorry, Annette. Annette. Um, I work at the Senior Center for people that don't know. Just to add what to Jennifer said, so the tax work program has been in effect many years, I don't know how many years, um, and it is administered through the Senior Center and people can apply, as she said, 60 and older. And I just wanted people to know that Currently, there's 25 jobs throughout the town, so whether it's the town hall or the library or the senior center, and we had over 50 applicants for those 25 jobs this year. So we end up having to do um, first-time applicants get a slot, and then if, um, so if we have 18 new applicants, they get the slot first, and then seven people, if we still have the seven slots for the 25, then they're put into a lottery pool and, um, and, we, and we draw. So um, just so you know, we're, we could even use more slots for this program. So they work the 137 hours and get the $1,500. It's all on the green sheet out at the front desk. So I feel like we already do kind of have some guidelines, so. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. I have a quick question about it. Um, is this considered taxable income or is, this, is the town paying Medicare yes, it or anything is. on it? It is considered taxable income. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Say aye. All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I have a motion under Article 11 as presented in the motion sheets. Is there a second? Elizabeth will do a quick presentation. Good evening. So I'm here tonight to discuss, uh, so here we go, low income senior tax relief. 18 months ago, uh, yeah, let's see, I get it. so the history of this motion tonight is that 18 months ago at our annual town meeting in 2017, there was a citizen's petition for senior tax relief and at that meeting there was a resolution to send this to a committee to bring something back that was tailor-made for our community and not just copied from another town. Shortly after the Board of Selectmen set up the Senior Low Income and Disabled Tax Relief Committee, we have nicknamed them the Slider Committee. We, the committee received input and review from numerous committees and town employees and they strove to balance ease of implementation with the program while reaching the homeowners who had the most need. What we're presenting tonight has been researched and built upon existing programs in other communities. Before I go on, I wanted to say thank you to the many people who worked on this program and if the moderator would permit that we have a round of applause for the folks that have given many, many hours. I will permit it. This committee met every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. for more than a year, I think, year and a half for at least two hours every week. So they put in a considerable amount of time and thought into this program. The goals for the program were first to identify the target population among seniors, low income and disabled taxpayers, and then to design a program that was simple to implement and to provide the most benefit to the individuals with the most need, and finally to determine how to pay for the program. So what the committee learned was that our low income homeowners are longtime elderly residents. So in that group of senior, low-income, and disabled homeowners that we were targeting, you may recall at the Springtown meeting, we did pass a program for folks with disabilities. We determined that the low-income population is captured by a senior, is captured within the senior population. So the property tax increases, as I'm sure we all can understand and know, have uh, surpassed Social Security and pension increases over the 
over the past several years. So we currently have the Massachusetts Circuit Breaker Program, which sets a target of paying no more than 10% of your income towards property taxes. And so if you look at the bottom of the screen, we have a chart, just some examples there. If you have a property valued at 300,000, your taxes would be $4,854. If your annual income is $35,000, which is quite typical for the population we're targeting with this program, they would be paying 14% of their income to taxes. So the qualifications for the program that we're proposing include that you have to qualify for the state circuit breaker program. You have to be at least 65 years old. The third criteria is that we're targeting this to 80% of the median assessed value of single family homes. Currently in Westford, that would be homes that are assessed at $400,000 or less, and that captures 33% of our homeowners. The asset limit is two times 41C. 41C is a local program that has a benefit of $2,000 a year. If you want to check if you picked up a green paper, this gives more details about the 41C program. And I want to point out here that home equity is not considered in your assets. And then at the bottom, you can see the income limits that we came up with. We tried, you can, you can see in many of these criteria, we tried to tie them to numbers outside of our community. We didn't, try, we didn't want to set hard numbers such as $400,000 for home limit. We tried to tie them to other markers so that they would change in the coming years and we wouldn't have to come back to town meeting to change those numbers. So the financial model for how this will work, there will be a variable benefit to homeowners. So all the applications will come in at one time. There will be a, an open window for applications every year. And the homeowners with greater need will get a greater, will receive greater assistance. The maximum benefit to any homeowner will be 50% of their tax bill. The range of benefit will be from nothing to $3,236, which is 50% of the tax bill of homes assessed at $400,000. We know that the maximum number of homeowners qualifying this past year would have been 347 homeowners, and that's based on the participation in the Circuit Breaker Program. The funding source is the assessor's overlay account, we are required by the state to put money into our overlay account every year that is held there in the event that someone challenges their taxes or their outstanding issues uh, with commercial properties. I would, if you have questions about this part, I'll defer to, to Dan. Uh, but we have that money available in the account so we could fund this program for the first three years. The maximum cost to Westford we are proposing is 0.25% of the levy. If the program were to start this year, that would be $162,000. And finally, we are including a three-year sunset clause, which means this program will automatically expire in three years, which will force us to revisit this program and approximately you know, one year into the program, we'll take the numbers and the information and then determine how we want to craft this program going forward and figure out a permanent funding mechanism at that time. So in summary, we're targeting residents who are just above the limits for 41C, which is 200% of the federal poverty limit. We've attempted to balance simplicity of the program with targeting the program to those who have the most need. We're limiting the scope of the program to fund it out of the overlay account. We have the three-year sunset clause, which will allow us to evaluate the program before making a bigger or long-term commitment. And finally, since taxes and exemptions are governed by mass general laws, a special act is required by the legislature to approve a tax relief article. So the article we passed in the spring for individuals with disabilities is currently making its way through the state. This article will also need to go on to the state and receive approval at the state and then come back for another vote at town meeting before we can start the program. Thank you, Elizabeth. Are there any questions? Okay. Hi, everyone. Mike Chasen, West Prescott Street. Uh, thank you, Selectman Almeida, for this for your presentation. Uh, I'm very tight with the money I like to spend, so I really appreciate that the committee put in that sunset clause. I would be cautious, though, it is an entitlement, and it's always hard to take away an entitlement. So that's kind of my concern about it, that there's no caps in place. So for future implementations of it, I'd like to see if the committee could do something along those lines. Thank you. Senator? Hi. On Section 3B, uh, you're stipulating a single applicant, age 65 or older, if a couple uh, together own the property and or it's left as life use but left to their children in a trust or some other form should neither of those cases be considered I 
Paul here, would he be able to? Paul Fass, Paul Fassbender? I'm sort of wrestling with this because uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how the wording of the, uh, uh, the bill that's going in is worded. Our intent certainly was that uh, the benefit would only apply if there is at least one resident property owner that is 65 or older. I would have expected that, uh, Madam Moderator, but that's not how it's written. So maybe some word something that the attorney might help. Um, Annette Cerullo, North Hill Road. I was also on the committee. I mean, I think one thing we have to keep in mind, too, is that this Annette. household has got to apply and get circuit breaker. So a married couple that files jointly, they don't have to both be of age 65, right? And so they have to at least, one of the criteria is they have to get circuit breaker first from the state. Um, and, you know, right now this year, they can get up to 1,080 off their tax bill. So, uh, well, not off the tax bill, they get 1,080 credits. So they have to get that first before they can even come to us for that program. It's a criteria. Um, so, but as far as trust, I, I mean, a lot of the other exemptions that we have currently in the town, I don't believe folks with trust um, get those exemptions. So is Paul here? Paul could answer that. There he is. Paul, Paul from the assessor's Paul office. Yeah, Thank Paul you. from the assessor's office knows this stuff by heart. Thank you, Paul. Paul, principal assessor. Um, if, if trusts are allowed as long as the people who are applying are trustees and not beneficiaries of the trust. They have to maintain the trust status. Likewise, if there is an estate, um, if there's a life estate, they also qualify just like the other exemptions do. So the life estate doesn't mean they've given up their rights to their home, but that they retain all of their rights. Likewise, the same with the trust. Thank you. Any other questions? That said, I think some wordsmithing might be needed by her attorney because neither of those two details are represented here. Thank you. Um, thank you through you, Madam Moderator. I wouldn't recommend changing the language at this point. Um, it specifies what the criteria is. It talks about property being owned and occupied by the applicant. Um, the definition of owner is a legal term, and when property is owned in trust, then the owner is considered someone who has a, a beneficial interest in the, in the trust. So my recommendation would be to leave the language as is. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I have a motion under Article 12 is printed in the motion sheets. Is there a second? Um, I think there's a typo. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. Um, with respect to the annual payment in lieu of personal tax for a term of years relative to a parcel, I believe a number is missing. Are we specifying a number of years? I'm sorry, this is Article 12? Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, did I jump ahead of the vote? <laughs> no. No, no, that's OK. Um, read, read it again. This is Article 12. I just, I just asked for a second. We've got a second. So we can, I was asked, now I ask for if there's any discussion. Okay. So that's your discussion. So tell us, um, tell so, me what line. Uh, it's the third line uh, with respect to annual payments in lieu of personal taxes for a term of years relative to a parcel of land located at Ted Commerce Way. Fourth line, I believe we're missing the number of years. And it's, John? it's, it's as it appears in the signed warrant as well. Okay. Uh, through you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. So what this article does is it authorizes the Board of Selectmen to negotiate an agreement for a term of years that they're going to negotiate. So, so you're, not, you're not specifying what the term of years is. You're just authorizing them to negotiate an agreement for whatever term they deem in the best interest of the town. Sorry, I completely misunderstood. Thank you. Thank you. 
gentleman. Steve Brierley, 16 Phillips Drive. Um, I'm a bit confused. My understanding of pilots is they are normally used for nonprofit organizations that would not pay property taxes. If I read this article correctly, these are limited liability corporations, profit-making entities. Why are we doing a pilot? Why are they not paying property taxes as commercial organizations? Paul Pliff will answer that question. He's behind you. The reason of a pilot is um, last three or four appellate tax board cases um, have ruled that basically solar entities are in fact exempt. <clears throat> And so we, our hands are tied, and it's based on a law that was written in 1985. Um, so at some point, we hope the legislature will have to change that. Uh, but yes, they are exempt, and that has kind of been the face value of the law. So. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? Yes, Madam Moderator. Um, despite what we were just told, I thought that at a prior selections meeting, we were told that the negotiation took place and it was for a 15-year agreement. So why wouldn't we put the 15 years in there? Because I think if we said five versus 15, folks might vote differently. Paul, would you mind answering that, please? At the time when the article was being put together, we had not reached an agreement. We had several back and forths uh, with the other party. Um, and probably about, about a week or so ago, yes, we finally did reach agreements. Uh, it's for 15 years, um, but the appellate tax board also is upheld for 20 years. So, you know, okay. and rather than 20 years, um, where a lot of uh, pilot agreements are for, we're doing ours for 15 years. So, I'm, I'm following up on what the first gentleman asked. Could we insert 15 in there for a term of 15 years? Paul, would you answer that, please? Well. That's up for the Board of Selectmen, and that is part of the agreement. So all this is allowing the Board of Selectmen to enter into the process to reach an agreement with them, which tentatively we have done at this point. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, I have one question with respect to the agreement. Does it pass to in the event of a sale of the um, facility, or is it tied to the current owner who's negotiating the agreement? Paul Pliff will answer that for you. Yes, it can, and it, it's in, within the terms of, of the agreement. So the town would have to approve uh, the transfer of the pilot agreement if the property, if the personal property were not sold. Thank you. Any further questions? Hearing no, no, no other discussion, I'll take the vote. Oh, I'm, someone was one more question over here. Alan Moyer, 69 Forest Road. I'm a little confused. What happens if we defeat this motion? I, I don't, I, it sounds like there's a whole bunch of negotiations that have happened. Does that all fall apart? What happens next? Paul? <laughs> if, if the motion is defeated, basically what would happen is we take the next step and we will go to appellate tax board, uh, where we will most assuredly lose. <clears throat> And then at that point, any taxes that have been paid, they are in appeals for the last two fiscal years, all of their tax dollars will go back to them and we will get nothing. Unless we enter a pilot agreement after the fact, and then we start the process all over again. Thank you. Any more questions? So that wasn't clear. I was suggesting we amend to include the 15 years. You have an amendment? Yes. You need to write it down. Between the word of and years that the first gentleman pointed out. Scott. I think, I think the key is that we have a tentative agreement, but a final agreement. So if we put it in 15 and we get 20 or 10, then we're in trouble. So I think until we get a, a firm agreement, we want to leave it flexible. And uh, But right now, the, the um, tentative one is 15. Okay. Here we go for the discussion. I'll take the vote. She, I'm sorry. Okay, do we we'll, we'll vote on the amendment? All those in favor of accepting? I'm sorry. Okay, you need to put it in writing if you're going to. We're going to no, you're not. Okay. Okay.
Okay, now we'll just, hearing no further discussion, we'll, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. All opposed? Unanimous. This um, motion passes unanimously. Having completed our business here this evening, may I have a motion to adjourn the special town meeting? Is there a second? All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks and have a great evening.